Good morning. This is Welcome to How to Effectively Present Your Data Model. How many folks in the room are data modelers or have to present a data model? Oh, I see all the hands go up. So we are all kindred spirits here. So my name is Norman Doust. I am a uh, consultant, author, and speaker. I create data models. Uh, conceptual, logical, and physical, like some of you. And I've worked on both transactional and data warehouse systems. I am uh, unfortunate that I can't seem to concentrate on just one thing, so I also do electronic health <coughs> data integration using the health level, stand health level 7 standard. And I do requirements modeling and business analysis training. So the goals of this presentation are pretty simple. I'd like to review several different techniques for presenting your data model. And um, so we'll go through each one. And for each one, we'll uh, talk about it. I'll give you a brief example. And we'll, uh, we'll discuss advantages and disadvantages. And we actually have eight of those. And then we'll uh, review some tips that can probably apply to all of those different techniques. And that's that. So uh, briefly, the outline is uh, we'll do an introduction here. We'll go through the eight techniques. We'll look at some tips. And then we'll do a summary. Um, so I have to give you some disclaimers here. First of all, I'm going to give you informal versus formal dictionary or ontology definitions, for that matter. Uh, second of all is the model diagrams have been abbreviated to fit on a slide. And those of you that model know that good diagrams frequently do not fit on a single slide. Um, and the final disclaimer is that uh, any diagrams that you see on the screen are beyond reproach. I have to say that for two reasons. One is I was giving a presentation before the Greater Boston Chapter of the International Institute for Business Analysis. And um, I always like to come up with examples of models that kind of everyone understands. So my example was um, uh, registering an automobile. So everyone, most people have automobiles. And we knew about registrations. And I talked about the different statuses that registrations have. They're, Hopefully, all of your motor vehicle registrations are active. They could be suspended or revoked and things. And so I was displaying a diagram on the screen. One person from the back, uh, Brant, raised his hand. He says, Norman, that's not right. I says, no, no, Brant, remember, I introduced this as a fictitious State Department of Motor Vehicles. He says, no, no, you don't understand. Three of us work for the Massachusetts um, registry of motor vehicles, and that diagram isn't right, and it's driving us crazy. <laughs> <laughs> so Brant was driven, and the others were driven crazy. <laughs> and so I will warn you that um, it's uh, kind of taking my life and my reputation in hand, displaying data models in front of a group of experts here. So I would encourage you to just look at them uh, for the examples that we will do, and I was going to say try not to be critical, but that's a foolish thing. So go ahead and complain if you like. Why should you care about presenting your data models? Well, one reason is you need it to be validated by subject matter experts. We've created it, and we've done the best we can. But how do we know that it's really correct? How do we know we got all the requirements and things done? And so the, one of the best ways of, of that is having your subject matter experts look at it and validate it and say, oh, yes, it's correct. And in order to do that, they really have to understand it as well. Um, and another reason is most business subject matter experts, they're not familiar with any of the notations that we use. And uh, or if you're using a data modeling tool and you're running through it and things, they're not familiar with how that works. But finally, perhaps more important for each of you is you've done a great job, and they need to know that. 
because it's important. Once they know that and they see that you've done a good job, you've developed their trust and it's going to make the rest of the process and your whole history with them go along well. And so those are why I think you should care about this. Um, so here are things which I didn't plan to cover. Um, I wasn't plan on covering whether you do it standing, whether you do it while you're sitting, whether you do it using a tool that you've got and walking through it, or you put things on PowerPoint slides, or you have a paper model on the wall and have people look at it. Um, whether you do it interactively with a group or whether you just send out uh, a document with all your explanations on it. Whether it's in person or you do it virtual. Having said that, I got an email message from uh, a person that I am working for and they said, Norman, can you, um, uh, tomorrow afternoon's uh, WebEx call, can you uh, explain the data model to these group of people? So I don't have any choice. Uh, three of the people are in Houston. Um, some of the employees of the company that we're working for are, one is in Kansas, another is in Nebraska, and my supervisor is either in Denver or some hotel somewhere where she's traveling. So we don't, I didn't have a choice. I'm not going to have a choice. So we have to do it virtually. And I'm not going to, I hadn't planned on covering whether you do it to individual, an individual person, a focus group of people, all the people from one department, or a large diverse group. And I realized last night, that's really not fair. You may have some questions on these. So questions, comments? Any of these things? Yeah. Are you assuming Bob? the people who are your audience have little or no knowledge of the process of data modeling and what it is? Is that an assumption? Yeah, that's what, what I was kind of tacitly assuming, that they don't know anything about how we create these things. Another good, um, some other, some, oh, yeah, so Steve. The way you present would be different depending on whether you're in a focus group, like an individual, or in a larger, exact. larger part of a known business process, mm -hmm. closely, probably focus group. Right, yep. yep. So how, how would that change how we present then? You might have to explain the business process to the first group. Right, yep. Yep, you see. And so, uh, so the first group you may have to explain the business process to. A focus group sometimes can be easier because they all have a certain level of knowledge and you can tailor the presentation to them. But on the other hand, I'll take the opposite point of view. If you've got a really large diverse group, you can kind of use it to help the people that don't understand the whole overview of things, and they may be able to see a larger slice of the company other than just their piece of it. I, I think it might also be important if whether your audience is the SMEs from which you gather the data, and you're sort of showing them the reconstitution of their knowledge, yeah, as it, opposed to their management. Ah, good point, right. So if you're doing it for the group of subject matter experts, they're really, they're really just validating that you've captured everything versus if you're doing it for their managers, you have to explain the whole thing. And that's a good point. Yeah. Any other comments, questions about that? Have any folks ever had to do it via document delivery? You know, you don't get a chance to actually do that. Was that a yes, Bob? Yes, and it's very difficult. It yeah. makes the process much more ineffective. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> and, I mean, looking at all these things, clearly I would favor interactive, in person, in the same room, so you can see people's comments and their, their eye looks. And so, is that really right? And um, I like 
I think I like doing it for a focus group because you can kind of uh, tailor the present, you know, the presentation for them. And you can probably anticipate the questions they're going to ask in advance. And if you're really good, you can answer the questions before they ask them. Let's see. And I actually prefer, um, well, I guess it, I'm going to go back to what you said, Bob. It's going to depend on the audience. If you just have a small group of three or four people and it's focused, perhaps it's better to be sitting down and doing it, you know, and uh, at their level. On the other hand, if you're working uh, with a group of the higher level folks that have to understand why, I would prefer probably standing to do it too. Uh, and it generally keeps people's attention more as long as you do it well. Yes, formalized versus informalized. Oh, and I didn't, we didn't even talk about that. I, I, I was trying to get away from that, but so yeah. So it depends. It's probably going to be a little informal if you've got your subject matter experts that you've de obtained these requirements from, and perhaps more formal the higher up the food chain you go. Other questions, comments? Okay, so here are eight different techniques, and I explicitly ordered them in number. <coughs> I'm going to contend that uh, the first, uh, that the lower numbers are perhaps the more effective. I'm going to highlight those first. So the first technique is don't. The second technique is recreate the model for the subject matter expert. Uh, walk through a section solving a business problem. Walk through a business story. Business stories, plural. 